alive. I'm alive. Hey, everybody. Can you hear my magic words? Somebody tell me I'm live. Somebody tell me you can hear me. Sounds great. Thank you, Alan Duggan and Scott Jernigan. Hey, everybody, it's Mike Myers here for his Monday, Wednesday at 2 o'clock Central Daylight Time live stream. Ask Mike anything. The goal of this live stream is to provide those of us who are isolated by the coronavirus an opportunity to continue our studies for CompTIA certifications. In particular, IT Fundamentals, A+, Net+, and Security+. Although we can certainly go beyond that. We don't even have to stay within CompTIA certifications. Uh, what I don't know, I'll make up. <laughs> uh, but uh, that is what we're here for. So this starts at 2 o'clock. Let me get some coffee. And uh, we will run till 4 o'clock or until the questions run out. So it's completely up to you guys. So the goal here is that you type your questions into the chat screen and we answer them. Uh, if I miss a question, don't feel bad. Just type it again. I'll catch it eventually. Uh, we also have uh, Scott Jernigan always here helping and watching the screen. So uh, he's always helpful in case I miss stuff, which I do. We also have lots and lots of great folks online. A lot of regulars who are showing up on a more and more common basis. Uh, it's always so funny. I feel like I do this big intro and it's always, you know, people show up a couple of minutes late, which is fine, which is absolutely fine. I understand. Uh, but I always feel like I have to repeat everything here in about five minutes, which I'm glad to do. Um, today is uh, PowerShell. So we're going to be doing some PowerShell today. We're really more of an introduction to PowerShell. I want to get some core stuff started in everybody's mind, and we're going to be building on this in later episodes. So I'm not going to spend two hours on PowerShell, mainly because if I spent two hours on PowerShell, your brain would melt. So what we're going to be doing here is breaking this up into smaller pieces, about 30 minutes each, <coughs> and uh, until I get everything covered. So I'm probably going to span two, maybe even three episodes to see how this goes. Also keep in mind, guys, that uh, you're my guinea pigs. So I'm always coming up with new and interesting and creative ways to teach stuff. So I take advantage of the fact that I'm free and the fact that you are motivated and interested in technical people to try new ways to show people stuff. And uh, PowerShell is certainly no exception to that. On top of that, I smoked two virtual machines for reasons still not to be quite determined, uh, but uh, we will, uh, we, we're, we should be okay. That's a little bit of an Apollo 13 day, but you know, worst comes to worst. I'll put in my tutu and we'll do PowerShell through interpretive dance. Fussy, fussy, fussy. So that could be a lot of fun too. Uh, -ba -ba -da -ba. What else we got going here? Uh, da -da -da. Uh, I am going to make, hold on a minute, a dear friend of mine who I've been trying to get online for a while. Uh, her name's Robin Abernathy. She's a name you should know. She is an author, uh, possibly one of the best developers of training materials I know of. Uh, we do not. Uh, step on each other's subjects, not that neither of us could, but you know. Uh, so uh, Robin and I had a wonderful conversation this morning. She works for Cyber Vista, uh, used to uh, Transcender. These are names you should ought to know if you're uh, looking at training materials. And uh, her and I had a wonderful conversation today about these little known certifications that are becoming very, very interesting to employers. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't hear of most of them. So I'm trying to set up, I'm going to be talking to Robin uh, later this week and I'm going to try to get Robin in here. She, she's cute as a button and she's got the, the, the most southern accent you ever heard, uh, but she is a very, very sharp technician, very, very skilled trainer, very successful author, and uh, fingers crossed that we can get Robin Abernathy to show up. So Robin, if you're listening in, if you're checking me out, this is what you get and more. Um, so, we'll see. I had an interesting question come in via the mail, and I'm going to try to find this here. Uh, where did I put it? So, I had someone ask, you ready? It's a well-known user. I'm not naming names because I'd never do that unless they directly allow me to. I was wondering if we could go over downloading a Windows free server 
trial ISO to VirtualBox and setting up a domain controller in Active Directory, adding users, etc. Might be a great learning video. So would any of you guys be interested in me doing something like that where we actually go through the process of setting up uh, virtual machines? I'm going to use VirtualBox and actually showing you guys how to download a Windows server and setting up basic Active Directory, that kind of a thing. It's going to be a couple of slow spots in it. I need to warn you because it's not a fast installation. But uh, really. Okay. <coughs> All right, guys. Uh, sure, then probably next week uh, we'll just see how PowerPoint goes. And I'm not against doing other stuff while between PowerPoints. But... Uh, we can set that up. So guys, that's fine, but please do me a favor. Make sure you have a Windows system that you can access. Well, you don't have to, you can watch the whole thing if you want, but it might be more fun if you follow the bouncing ball kind of a thing. And uh, we'll, we'll go through an incredibly detailed process to show you guys how to set all this up. Well, probably what we would do is on day one, just get the server downloaded and running. So, lots of people are, yeah, Somali, I hear you, man. Uh, we can, uh, we'll do that. So, plan for like next week. Scott Jernigan, please help me remember that if you would, uh, making sure that uh, we could do something like that. It's fun and it's, it's a little detailed and it does require some understanding of Windows Server, but it's actually not that complicated. What gets me in trouble is that there have been so many versions of Windows Server that I've supported over the years that I'll be working on one and I'm like, it's not 2000 anymore, Mike. This is a newer version. But the basic steps are all still there. So you got it, guys. All right. I want to make sure I'm not missing any more. Uh, well, it looks like uh, I'll be a graduation presenter for... Per Scolis, which is one of my favorite uh, tech schools here in the United States. And uh, Per Scolis has been a big buyer of my materials for many, many years. And what I like about them is not only are they a tech school, but they work very hard on job placement for their students. And uh, they really have done an amazing job. Uh, pretty impressive. The downside is, is they're asking me to apply for this, which they say is a write a 200 word essay is it high school here all right we'll put it together anyway so that's pretty cool I always like uh, if you're not familiar with the per scolis school they do an amazing job and uh, they really do help their students out a lot which is why I like them uh, what else we got in the mail that I haven't been checking out yeah, for all of you guys who sent me emails on Monday, I have not responded to a single one of them. I apologize. I'm just buried, that's all. So uh, I, do, I do have your emails that you guys sent on Monday, and we are, uh, I will be there for you. Mm. Here is another viewer who's been on who was the first head of product for AWS back in 2002. Isn't it funny that 2002 sounds like a long time ago? It doesn't to me. Isn't it more terrifying that cloud computing is, not, is barely 15 years old? <coughs> oh my goodness. You kids don't know how good you got it. Mm-mm-mm. Uh, we did get an answer from one of our readers who had taken the uh, online uh, on at home testing and the system just died on them. Not on his end, it was on the other side and uh, they had a support person online with him for a substantial amount of time. Uh, they gave him a free retake. It just took him so long and they weren't able to figure it out. So that's pretty exciting. And uh, in a few days, they reset the whole thing. And the only thing that was upsetting is he was uh, 
almost done with the test when it died. How frustrating would that be? Yipe. I can't even imagine. You know, you're literally most of the way through the exam, and then it just goes, burp, bam. Mm, lots of email. I'm just trying to catch up. Okay, I think we're finally back to uh, caught up on the, the critical email, or at least I have good excuses for those of you I haven't responded to on a timely basis. I promise I'll get to it. I'm being pulled in so many different directions at once. I'm only one man. <sighs> this is where I say something like, uh, I need 25 hours in the day or something like that. Yeah. All right, let's take a look, see what's happening. Question-wise, Elbow's here, Tolowitz here, Andre's here, da -da 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 -da. Connor's here. Da -da 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 -da. It was a cartoon uh, called The Archies. It's from your childhood or before you guys. Don't worry about it. Alan Duggan's here. <coughs> I'm looking at names more than I'm looking at anything else. And now my phone keeps going nutsy. Is there, am I missing something critical here? Ah. All right. Well, first of all, I uh, just do want to remind you, thank you, Scott, for reminding me that uh, just because you guys were nice enough to show up to my live stream, we are giving away, yeah, we have a 50% discount on all A+, plus, Net+, plus, Total Tester, and Total Sims, Total Tester, Total Sims bundles, and the Security Plus Total Tester. Just go to www.totalsim.com, and after you've got all your loot, type in Carpe Diem, C-A-R-P-E-D-I-E-M, Carpe Diem, at checkout for a 50% discount, which is already amazing because I think we're about the cheapest out there. And uh, we're giving it for 50% off, just because I love you guys. Tolowit, read this, colon, okay. I'm sure this is all being fixed. Yeah, I told it. I'm sure you're going to post that link, and I'll check it out later. Okay. What's happening out here today, kids? Ulysses Ferrar, hiya, hiya. Brendan S., there he is. Elbow, guys, I'm having storage issues. I've installed too many games. Yeah, and they're all falling victim to the power of the almighty build. Don't install so many games. Steam is your friend. Hey, Dr. Quinn. Da, 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 da. N2CU, nice to see you. I am so bad at acronyms like that. I was just like, N2CU, is that a ship on the Enterprise? I don't remember. Uh, Dave L is here. Jose Braden, hello, Jose. Uh, Dr. Quinn, does anybody ever tease you and say, Dr. Quinn, medicine woman? Am I just that old that I remember that? Brendan S, yes, obviously I did get your email since we just talked about it, my brother. We're gonna do that just for you. Da, 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 da. Uh, Somali, we're not going to do Power, uh, PowerShell scripting today. We're just going to get, I want you guys to get comfortable with the command sets and some of the interface stuff, some of the nomenclature. Uh, that's going to keep us plenty busy today, trust me. And then we will march towards scripting uh, next time, probably Wednesday. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, just checking. Raptor 96, just bought your A-plus and Network Plus books. Very excited to go through them. Raptor 96, read them one at a time. I kid, is joke. Uh, John Easterling, my brain's melting trying to read your book on the A-plus. Oh, John, that hurts a little bit because I, 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 I try, because I know A-plus is kind of an intro certification for so many people. I try really hard. I put funny jokes in there. 
There's tons of Easter eggs. If you look hard enough, you can find my personal cell phone in there. Uh, you can find all my WoW characters. I'm not playing much World of Warcraft these days. Uh, with the next day plus, I'll put in new characters. Tarum Chab Chadha. Chadha. Hi, Mike. Big fan from India. Oh, my gosh. What time is it there right now? It's got to... Uh, you got to be at like, what is it? It's like 2 a.m. Isn't India almost perfectly across from the States? But welcome aboard. Drink some coffee. Roshan Peterson, how to fix your cinnamon when it crash? I'm going to let you develop that a little bit more. So, Taran, the, the thing is, is I, I don't, I never mind asking questions, but like, for example, what you're saying right there is, so broad. Uh, what kind of crash? When does it happen? Uh, did you add new equipment? You know, that kind of a thing. Listen, uh, do me a favor. Uh, this is for anybody. So there's two ways to ask me questions. One is to type them in into the chat, which is great. But the other way to do it is you can send me an email. So if you want to, just send me an email to michaelm at totalsem.com. That way you can develop a little bit. You're not trying to fill the chat window with uh, that kind of stuff, which again, you're even welcome to do that. I don't care. It's all good. But, um, you know, don't be in a big panic to try to type a bunch of stuff in chat when you can just send me an email. By the way, if you're a gamer on Steam, I'm Senor Pepe. And in general, I'm Des Weds on just about everything. So if you want to Get me on Discord. I'm Desweds. You can always find me. Um, oh, I'm beeping and honking. Okay. I, Tolowit, I can't read your article right now because we're in the live stream, but I will check it out. It was something about DNS. We'll look at that. DNS is not a bad thing. DNS, well, we wouldn't be where we are without it, kids. We just need to get DNS more DNS sec more established and we all need to put uh, pie holes on our individual networks I kid Debbie Strouch is here told it what's a cinnamon told it a cinnamon it's a spice so that's a, a cinnamon uh, Kevin Lopez is here da -da 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 -da. Roshan Patterson, I don't know but what my computer said. <laughs> I don't understand what you're asking me, sir. Luis Ferrara, is that an Astros cap? Yeah, I'm in Houston, Texas. Here, man, I love the Astros. <laughs> Can't hear you over the banging. Man, why... Kevin Lopez, I applied for five jobs last week, got my first application rejection. Kevin Lopez, remember, for most people, it's a 100 to 200 applications followed up by anywhere from five to 10 interviews and one job. So this is just the numbers game we play. John Easterling, anyone know a good way to focus on reading with ADD? Yeah, don't read. <laughs> Seriously, watch videos, do stuff. I know people who have ADD and they, they just do practice questions and they practice on equipment. You know? Books aren't for everybody. I'd, I'd love everybody to buy my books. In fact, I'd love every one of you guys to buy 15 copies of my books. My mortgage would appreciate it, but uh, no, not everybody, not everybody, uh, not everybody needs to read everything. There's visual learners, there's kinesthetic learners, there's audio learners. Everybody's, you know, got their own thing. Travel and tech. CompTIA exam, CompTIA exam objectives is helpful in exam, or do we memorize this one or not? Uh, no, the, the CompTIA objectives are really a way for you to look at what they're going to be teaching you about. Uh, they would be useless in the exam itself. I hope I'm, I hope I'm understanding what you're trying to say to me here, my brother. Um, you, you don't 
you do not memorize objectives. You memorize the topicalities that go with those objectives. There are certain objectives like, uh, so I assume you're talking about the A-plus travel and tech. Keep in mind CompTIA has about 15 different certifications. So I'll assume you're talking about A-plus, uh, but uh, no, I mean, you don't want to just, like, like for example, it, I, I get very frustrated when people are like, what does DHCP stand for? And uh, I don't care what DHCP stands for. I want to make sure you understand what DHCP is and how it works and, and that type of thing. So I would say, honestly, the people who need the uh, CompT objectives more than anybody else are people like me who are developing training materials. So no, I would say you don't need that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Yes, Brendan S., I got the email. Tony Lejun, Lejun, sorry for messing up your last name, dude. I have a feeling I'm not the first person to do that. <clears throat> Hello, Mike, hope all is well. Yeah. I'm currently experiencing shutdown issues on my PC. My PC is smaller than average, so my power supply isn't as big as normal. Could my equivalent be the power board? Thanks. Uh, Tony, uh, anytime you have intermittent failures on any system, the number one thing you need to look at is the power supply. Uh, in all probability, if you built this system, you may have had an underpowered power supply, but if it was a pre-built system, I would guess that um, your power supply is overheating. I think you had a heat issue more than anything else. Uh, I would, uh, assuming it's a desktop system or even a laptop, I'd be breaking it down a little bit, checking for dust and dirt and that type of thing, clearing the system, making sure I'm in a nice room temperature environment. See these people, they take their desktop systems and put them in these cute little shelves in these desks and they basically cut off all the airflow. Uh, but when you tell me the system is uh, experiencing shutdown issues, if it was intermittent, that would be the big question I'd ask you if you were standing next to me. I would be looking at the power supply first and foremost. Power supplies die a lot, a lot. Um, I don't know about you guys, but here in Houston, Texas, we don't have exactly what you'd call beautiful sine wave voltage coming in from Houston lighting and power. So uh, power conditioners, surge suppressors uh, are absolute requirements here, but uh, UPSs are, in my opinion, not really an option anymore for any system. Uh, because not only does bad power, your power supply has built-in capacitors that can take a lot of surge, but they get destroyed over time. Uh, what you probably need to get is, uh, I'd get a new power supply. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's sub hundred dollars unless you've got some beast of a system. And uh, it's just it usually a pretty easy thing to fix. So I'm assuming you got a desktop, but I don't know. Do, do, do. Howlin', howlin' at the moon. Hello, Mike. Could you direct me to set up a direct circuit with a router? All routers have direct circuits. A standard TCP IP router is always going to be a point-to-point -point connection, unless it was more upstream and you were using things like BGP. In that case, you would have multiple point to point connections. Uh, I'm worried, I don't know what a direct circuit is. Uh, I gotta warn you, man, every time I think I know a lot about computers, somebody like that says something to me. Direct circuit, howling at the moon, tell me what a direct circuit is. Scott, you know what he's talking about? Okay. But just howling at the moon, just because I don't know this first step, that doesn't mean we just throw the question out, all right? Go ahead and build on it. Feel free to keep adding into live chat. Send me an email. Here you go one more time. You can send me an email about this. Also keep in mind that uh, a lot of times I know something, but maybe I use a different term or phrase and uh, it's okay. So never a problem. Birungi Godfrey. I want to do certification A+. How do I get certified and how do I get certificates? 
Well, Burundi, you're in the right place to start here, my friend. Number one, uh, a plus certification is administered by an organization called the Computing Technology Industry Association. Scott, can you type that in for Burundi, Burundi, please? So www.comptia.org, they are the administrators. I am just one of many training providers who provides training materials, you have to pay for them, so to help you pass. Uh, I've been doing it for 25 years. I think I'm pretty good at it, uh, but there are many, many people. So you, uh, study for the examination. Most people, I always recommend using videos, a book, and practice questions, and you gotta buy all three of those, sorry. Um, but then you, you study for the exam, and then you schedule to take the test with uh, CompTIA. You, you schedule the exam at uh, Prometric View. Scott, give, the, give him the URL, please. Uh, Onview.com. Uh, and then you have to pay money for that as well. So for most people, simply taking the CompTIA A plus is usually just shy of about $1,000 US. The majority of that, the one biggest single cost there is the uh, paying for the exam. And if you, there's two exams, and if you fail one or both, you have to pay for them again. So it's something you really wanna work hard to uh, study well and be ready for it. And th that's what we provide here. Jose Braden, what is your Discord or Steam account name? I am Desweds, D-E-S-W-E-D-S -E at all things. I'm not doing a lot of gaming right now though, guys, because Scott Jernigan's making me work really, really hard. Wissa's online? Hey, look, Wissa, I'm wearing a NASA shirt. Uh, Philip D. Charmoy, how do I prepare for the MD100 exam? If I were you, I'd probably start with Udemy. Uh, they have some good instructors for uh, that exam. I think they do a good job on it. And uh, I, I can't recommend, so I'm always a video, a book, and practice questions. Since we don't provide for that particular exam, uh, that would probably, Udemy is a, a pretty good place to go. Of course, lynda.com is also a good second choice. The reason I pick uh, Udemy over Linda is uh, Udemy's probably going to have three or four authors on that topic. And a lot of times you can kind of pick somebody who's more your speed, if you know what I mean. Nothing's ever finished, Andre. Nothing's ever finished. A9YL. I took my A plus exam last week and I failed. Oh, no. A9YL, so I would have a lot of questions for you. Number one, were you using my training materials? Um, did you fail by just a small amount? Was there particular areas? Uh, do you feel you have good study habits? Do you feel that you're a good test taker? Number one, don't worry about it. Everybody fails some percentage of their certification exams. I personally fail about a third of mine, all right? I understand it's money. I understand it's time. It's a hassle but it's not like your SATs. You can just retake them again and you'll be okay. And stick around. A9YL, just A9YL. I'm always like, does that, should that mean something? A9L, A9L. Am I close? Uh, so you, you just need to buckle down. You need to get that exam rescheduled and uh, just take it again. Uh, and again, uh, you know, just uh, here, send me a little contact information. What did you do, A9? <coughs> Sorry. What did you do? Did you just go in cold? Did you study? What did you study with? You know, that kind of a thing. Give me some information and I'll help you out. Mm -mm -mm. You are not alone. Chaco Taco, hey everyone. Kind of a random question here. Have you ever made a VM honeypot for tech scammers? The only honeypots I would ever make would be a virtual machine. I would never uh, 
you know, a honeypot's being exposed to naughty people. So the last thing I'm ever going to do is expose a bare iron system to them. I mean, maybe in some classroom stuff, I've done some more silly things. But no. Sorry, kids. Um, no, I haven't. And I wouldn't. You want to do it in a VM. Now, the question you have, Choco Taco, is where do you put that VM, right? Because the VM has to have some degree of exposure. And uh, even though a lot of people would disagree with me, for kind of a do-it-yourself situation, I would probably, uh, I'd be uh, putting the machine, believe it or not, uh, I'd have it in NAT, behind a NAT router, and I would do port forwarding so that I could really limit carefully what ports the bad guys are going to be playing with. And the bigger question is, Chaco Taco, is what kind of uh, honeypot software are you going to be using? Uh, there's some wonderful tools out there in Linux for basically honeypots. And of course, if you're going to ask me to memorize them off the top of my head, I don't have one. But a little quick research would probably be the best way to do that. Uh, you don't have to go setting up DMZs or anything hairy like that. Who's got two routers anyway? But uh, <clears throat> not only do you not have two routers, but you are not going to be paying for multiple IP addresses either, are you? Don't blame you. But you can get, you, you'll get lots and lots of fish. Uh, just a little honey pot behind a NAT router with port forwarding. You'll, you'll be shocked. On average, you take a, a router and you light it up and expose it to the internet, you're going to get, uh, I like to say the word probed, but that makes everybody giggle, but that's exactly what it is, usually within about one minute. You know, I wouldn't be surprised every 30, every 30 seconds something's happening. But home routers are, you know, home routers do a pretty good job of protecting idiots like us who don't know how to, you know, protect ourselves. You, you take an AT&T uh, modem out of the box, with Comcast, whatever, cable, whatever, the amount of protection they have built into them. I don't know why I'm yawning, guys. I had a good night's sleep. Uh, they, they have a lot of protection built into them. Chaco Taco, if you decide to actually do something like that, let me know because I would love, love, love to see what your results are. And I'm behind on what kind of honeypot software is fun these days because I probably haven't set up a realistic honeypot in five years. So I'd be curious to see what's out there. But I don't know if tech scammers. Tech scanners? I think that's what you mean. Scam. Tolowit, yeah, there, there is probably a Linux distro for just about everything. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad Scott Jernigan has to ask the when is the book going to be done questions because whenever I see questions like that, I just want to go, I'm hiding. Kevin Lopez, would you agree that learning and working and networking first is necessary for people who want to go into cloud or cybersecurity? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you, you couldn't do it without it. I mean, even my Security Plus uh, courses just assume you have Network Plus or the equivalent amount of networking knowledge. It, 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 you, take, you sit down for a CompTIA Security Plus or CYSA or CASP or any of these courses, they're not going to be asking you questions like what port number is DNS, but they are going to be showing you log files where something's banging on port 53 or whatever it might be, and you just have to know that stuff. It builds from there, guys. So, yeah. Yes. Jose Braden, do you have a Discord server? No, Jose, I don't. I'm not. If somebody ever actually wants to set it up and gets any kind of traction on it, I will drop in from time to time and say hello, but... Uh, I'm like super busy, so it's hard to do, um, but uh, you are welcome to do that. See what that hand motion means? That means, Jose, I grant thee permission. I call it papily dispensating you. Oh, Andre saying nice things. 
I also heard through the grapevine that maybe me and Scott are a little slow on the Security Plus book, but I've also heard all of our competitors way behind that uh, <clears throat> COVID has really slowed down book development. I have a friend of mine, uh, Audrey O'Shea, who's actually been on this channel a couple of times, and her book, The Geek Girl's Guide to Electronics, uh, really slowed her down. But I do have my copy. I'm very excited to see that book. Voo D, how do you protect data in use? How do you protect data in use? It's interesting you didn't use the word data in transit because that's the more interesting thing for me. Uh, data in use. Um, oh, Scott, I'm embarrassed. I'm a little behind on this stuff. I'm literally going to have to pull my book out and get you the answer, Voody. Sorry. RJ, Mike, how do you remember so much information? Here, I literally forgot about data in use, which I should know. We've been writing on this for Security Plus, and you say that. Uh, well, the answer is, RJ, is as you can well see, I don't remember all the time. Uh, it's all that rock and roll music when I was a teenager. Tom Legwin, yes, I have a desktop. Does purchasing a power board make sense? No, I don't even know what that is. You have an alien, oh boy, you have an Alienware X51 R2. I don't know that one off the top of my head. Let me check that out real quick. I get a little nervous about Alienware. And, and no offense, I just think Alienware tends to be a little overpriced. In general, I don't want to say it always is. Oy. I see what you got. It's only about 500 bucks. Hang on. It's only a 330 watt power supply. Uh, I just found them right here on Amazon for uh, $69, $53, questionable source, 60 bucks for a new power supply. Honestly, power supplies, like, I don't keep anything in stock in way of parts other than power supplies. Now, granted, I'm not talking about a weird alien, not weird, it's a perfectly fine system. Uh, but I, I, I usually have one ATX, usually like 600, 650 watt power supply just laying around because enough stuff dies around me that, uh, and it's also nice to have a good power supply as a test with a known good component. Um, yeah. Yeah, I used to keep hard drives around before SSDs. That was always my big line, is that the two most breaking parts of a computer was the power supplies and the hard drives. And now with SSDs, they don't die nearly as much. I guess I should qualify that. And the big problem people run into with SSDs is they forget that they have a limited lifespan of rights. And uh, you work an SSD hard, doing a lot of rights. Uh, you can, I've seen SSDs last two years, and then they have to be replaced because they just wear out. <laughs> the problem I have with, all right, well, yeah, Scott Jernigan brought up a good point. There's a component you can have to test power supplies. Um, and I've, I've actually shown it on here a few times. They're pretty standard. You can get them just about any place. Um, the, the problem I have is that Power supplies die in one of two ways. They die easy or they die hard. When they die easy, that's when those power supply testers are very handy because uh, all you have to do is put on any of the 12 volt, ignore the rest of the junk, put it on a 12 volt. In fact, you don't even need a power supply tester. Honestly, if you're comfortable at all with a voltmeter, you can do it with a voltmeter and uh, watch the 12 volt outputs. And if those outputs start dropping down to 11 and a third, 11, 
whether they're almost a volt under 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 voltage, that's how they die easy. Dying hard is a whole different game, man. Uh, power supplies have so many different parts. The way different rails are used on the power supply can affect things. Uh, dirt, fans, all of this stuff comes into play as well. Why is my phone going bananas again? Oh, people are emailing me. Okay, cool. Is there anything I can catch right now? So, uh, you know, power supply testers are good. I mean, if you actually are in the business and you're working on enough systems, having a power supply tester is always a good thing to have. Uh, it's nice because they can plug right into the P1 and they actually give it load, which is also important. Uh, the other thing power supply testers do well is they test, uh, they test uh, all of the uh, rails, if you give the right one, or at least they'll test rail one and rail two. People tend to forget about rails, but they're important. And uh, Okay, uh, John, this is, I got your email, man. Uh, you don't have any funds. Well, there's a couple of things you can do then, my friend. Number one, you got my book, so that's a start. Uh, keep in mind, you need the certification to get a job that's, ooh, geez, dude. Uh, John, I'm going to respond to this personally offline. Okay, so uh, another person said, if I buy the course and book, how do I get the certificates? The physical hard copies? Nobody really cares about the hard copies. No one would be interested. When you sit down at a Pearson testing center, and Pearson testing centers are all over the world, okay? And um, you, when you sit down at the testing center, you immediately know whether you've passed or failed. It will say pass or it will say fail, okay? And, uh, you know, once you have that, you, you'll get in the mail. I don't even, do they still give paper certificate? I think they do. You get a little pen, you get a little card. But what's important is that you get a CompTIA member ID number. And that number ties into all of your CompTIA certifications. So, uh, gosh, I don't want to make people start saying unfair things, but I don't know of anybody who actually checks that stuff. But you got a friend who's setting you up with a job, so that's a little bit different. But, uh, yeah, the, if I were to want to verify that someone has passed a CompTIA certification, I would go to CompTIA and I would look up your name and it would list publicly pretty sure publicly. I would have to know, ah, that's not true. I would have to know your CompTIA number and it would tell me what certifications you have. So that's how uh, you know. So you take this test from uh, Pearson, just waiting for Scott to yell at me on something here. Public libraries often purchase access to LinkedIn Learning, lynda.com. So that is a good point. Uh, if you're willing to go to a public library, a lot of them offer the videos for free, but you got to go to the library. So uh, that, that could be another option for you. Uh, Tarun Chadra, is Linux Plus there in Total Sim? No, Tarun, we don't do Linux Plus. I'm just buried. With, between A plus, Net plus, and Security plus, I'm, I'm at the end of my tether. I got nothing left. Color definition. Is there a Discord for studying? No. But once again, if one of you guys gets the chutzpah to go ahead and say, I'll set up a Discord server, uh, you know, work together. Talk about it here on the chat. I'll pop in from time to time, not very often, but I will pop in. I mean, this is where I help, right? But you guys get a Discord server set up, maybe that'd be a place you could put questions together or something. You have my permission to do this. People keep talking about it, but nobody's doing it. Uh, a lot of questions today, which is good. That's why I'm here. I want to make sure at 3 o'clock we're going to start PowerShell no matter what, so... Elbow, activated Windows this morning. Now you put stickers on my case. Yes, you do. And the other thing you need to do 
is get your bootable Windows thumb drive ready to go and tape that to your case too in case you ever have troubles. Then you got your CD key, you got a bootable copy of Windows. Every system I've got has got a little thumb drive with it. I usually tape it on top of a monitor and that way if I ever got trouble I got the CD key and I got it bootable ready to go and I also have the local administrator username and password memorized. God, that's so frustrating to me. People, their systems down, they don't even know what their local their local administrator is. Or if they've got the, the administrator disabled, somebody is in the administrator's group. It's, it's a real hassle to have to go through the, you know, cracking that stuff. Which it's just doable. It just adds time. And it, the most important thing is you got to do it on your own machines. Because I'll, I'll be honest with you, I forget. I just straight up forget. It's like, what did I set up as the local, or anybody with administrator privileges on this system? I don't remember. John Mello, Josh Mello. Hi, Mike. Huge fan of your training. Thank you, sir. I can't wait to use your training and get my A+. Plus. Go get him, Tiger. I really appreciate your attitude towards failings, because I've failed a million of these, Josh. Are you kidding me? I know, and, I, and, here, and of course, I also like to add that most of the time when I failed exams, I was as poor as you were. Doing a little better these days, mainly because I'm old, but uh, yeah, it sucks. I'm not going to say it doesn't suck, but it's just part and parcel of our game. And the funny part is, the ones I fail are the ones I'm most confident about. I don't know why. You know, I remember like the first time I took CASP, I was like, I know this stuff, and I went in, I was like, uh... <laughs> that was humbling. What are you going to do? Dave L., good evening, Mike. I lately heard about Docker. Is that different than a virtual box? Okay, Dave, uh, you mean a virtual machine, right? Uh, so a virtual machine is a real operating system that sits on top virtual hardware. So it would be like virtual box or something like that, okay? A, a, a Docker is a tool, where's Michael Smyer when I need him? Docker is a tool that creates, Scott Jernigan's going to type it right in for me now and remind me. Hold on. I got to look it up now because I can't leave you hanging. Container. There we go. So a virtual machine uh, is a machine that it's a real operating system running on virtualized hardware. Uh, one more time, make sure I'm not lying to you. A container is a real application that's running in a virtualized operating system. Uh, containers, and Docker pretty much invented the whole concept of containers, Containers are, are an important tool for developers uh, where they can make small changes to their entire, it's a web app is a very common place for this. You know, keep in mind a web app isn't just like one HTML document, right? You usually got different versions of, you know, Java engine behind that and all these other tools and anti-malware or whatever it is. All of these programs collectively are making www.totalsem.com work, okay? So when Michael Smyer, who's our uh, number one developer at Total Seminars, he uses Docker as a tool. Docker keeps track of versioning. It allows multiple programmers to work on the same thing, so it has real good control, so people aren't uploading up there. There's a publishing aspect that brings it up to the final thing. It, you can go back to an earlier version of the software. But the idea behind Docker, uh, uh, or anything like that, is that uh, the uh, container itself is like a virtualized operating system. So it's going to use the operating system you've got there. J just like a virtual machine uses the hardware you got but virtualizes it, Docker, or any program that runs containers, Docker isn't the only one out there. They take the actual native OS and they grab a virtualized version of it and uh, they protect and separate it. So it's a very powerful tool. Mm -hmm. 
You guys are making me think today. I've got brain hurt. Da, da, da. God, Alice, Alice Potsy's here. Now we're in trouble. Elbow. Mike, can you quickly explain the difference between internet and intranet? Yeah, most networks all run on TCP IP. The internet is the huge TCP IP network which spans the globe and even goes into space these days. An intranet is a private internet. It is usually physically disconnected from the internet itself. It is a, it is the, it is, it, it has routers, it has TCP IP, but it's its own uh, separated thing. Although there might be some firewalling that would connect intranets to the internet. Uh, an intranet is like a private internet. They can do their own IP numbering systems. They can ignore everything. They can do anything they want. Kevin Lopez, I've seen CompTIA high I like people on LinkedIn. I've seen that too, Kevin. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, and so I get, yeah, lots and lots. <laughs> Elbows hitting 900 frames per second on Minecraft. That's not overkill, is it, buddy? Tomas Protovin. It's the person who has the choice to... Yes, yes, they do. They have the choice whether they want to list it or not. The problem I run into on, uh, on, on LinkedIn is that people will take my training videos on lynda.com and then they pass the training, whatever, they watch all the videos so they get a certificate of completion. And I've had many people go, oh, I'm A-plus certified. I was like, no, no, you just watch the videos. So that can be a little frustrating. No bullies. I am taking both your A-plus and net-plus courses. You ought to do one or the other, man. Or like concentrate on one and then do the other. I'm focusing more on networking for job reasons, but I'm enjoying both. Well, both A-plus and net-plus obviously have networking in it, but you know, the A-plus is really designed for the networking you understand is on this one system how it's part of a network. So this one system, how do you connect to a WAP? This one system, uh, they do have like Soho routers and it would be about it. Whereas the Network Plus really looks at networks themselves. So a lot more switches, a lot more routers, that kind of a thing. I like them both. You know, guys, I'm doing well enough in life, I don't have to write another A Plus book. I do A Plus because it's Fantastic, and I think it expands people's minds. Uh, before A plus, there was nothing, and the world was dark and void. And I have my problems with CompTIA. Don't ever kid yourself. Uh, I, I, they're number one critic, but not only are they the only game out there. I think they're a good game. They are. Are they a little money hungry? I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to make that accusation, but um, CompTIA tries hard to create a certification based on the real world practical knowledge that people need to know. And as long as they keep doing that, I'll continue to support them. I'll also tell you the day I feel they're not doing it, I'm gonna tell them they're not going to. They, they, they're, they're, they're pretty serious minded people. Hell, the president of the company is one of the biggest nerds I've ever met. Okay guys, Jose Braden just said he's gonna start the Discord server. There you go, Jose. You said it online, so now it's real. Allie, do exam cram or cram guides help? Sure. Uh, my problem with any kind of cram anything is that, and, and by the way, I have the Mike Myers Passport series for A plus and Net plus, so I make cram books too, but um, the goal in my opinion, is that, uh, sorry, I'm, Scott, you want me to start mentioning the timestamp every time I say something? I will do that, I'm sorry. Um, where, where was I? I'm a little, oh, the problem I have with exam cram books, even my own, uh, is that they don't teach the whys. Uh, they, they're reacting to the objectives 
and don't really make you a good tech, in my opinion. Um, I know lots of people have used my passport books and passed A plus and net plus. In my experience, most of the people who do that are experienced techs who want to focus on the exam. I don't have to really teach them you know, what disk management is. They have a feel for it. They want to get a sense of what's going to be covered in disk management. So, yeah, you can do it. Tolowit, you're just on a roll. I stick my bootable floppies on the side of the case with a magnet. Tolowit's last name is D. Gauss, by the way. Kevin Lopez, is SQL a tedious language to learn relative to other languages? Well, is it tedious? I have found that almost any topic can be wildly interesting if the student is motivated to learn it. So the old line I always use when I'm writing anything or doing anything is, don't explain any, to anybody what a screwdriver is until you first show them a screw. And then most of the time, it'll make sense to them. Uh, SQL has been around for a long time. I have a very dear friend of mine who makes multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, and all she does is make some of the most complicated SQL queries you've ever seen in your life. It's just that she is like redonkulously good at it. Uh, and when she talks about SQL, her eyes light up, and she gets all excited, and uh, it's because she has a need for it. There, there, there's, there's a fire burning that says, we need to extract this data from this 45 terabyte database. Who can do it? And that's where SQL, in my opinion, becomes fascinating. Um, I, I, find, I find SQL incredibly tedious until I need it, then it's fascinating. I say that about a lot of things in tech. And to be honest with you, because SQL is really a query language more than anything else, I, I, I would find it to be fairly limiting. I mean, I would find PowerShell to be more complicated in the long run because PowerShell is a very much a general purpose shell and scripting language and so many other things, whereas SQL really only has one job, and that is to look at tables and query data or add stuff to it or delete stuff to it or split them or it's always messing with tables. Andre, Mike, if you feel too confident, you get sloppy and fail. Got to stay sharp. That's very true, sir. That is very true, Andre. I will not argue with that one bit. Oh, uh, sorry, Scott, 248. I'm only 10 minutes behind. John Easterly, company just started requiring the A+. Plus. Hey, John, do me a favor. Tell all your buddies about Mike Myers. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I got to make money. Is it, does anyone find my capitalism offensive? Uh, I live in Texas. Come on. Lots of at signs. So I'm figuring you guys are doing good. David Zientra, there is a 2.49 p.m. There is a difference between virtual machine and container, absolutely. Kevin Lopez at 2.49, I always hear the Docker and Kubernetes. There's a lot of these different container tools. I mean, if you're writing code, you're probably using some form of containerization, pretty much across the board. Oh, another big scroll. Elbow, Mike, I'm sorry, I disobeyed 255. I pretty much completely build the PC before booting. You fool! And now you get what you deserve. Bomb Squad 254. Hey, Mike, would your A plus Udemy course alone prepare you for the exams? Uh, Bomb Squad, I think people always need three things. Number one, they need a video. Number two, they need a book. And number three, they need practice questions. I know a number of people who have successfully passed using just the Udemy course or, or the Linda course or whatever. Uh, I feel that in order to maximize your probability of passing, you need those three things. I would strongly recommend that you get an outside source of practice questions uh, at the very least. Maybe you're not a book person. Okay, fine. 
uh, but get practice questions. We sell them at Total Seminars and we're selling them at 50% off, which by the way, guys, I feel like Linus Tech Tips on, on uh, YouTube. We have Ask Me Anything deals for this week, 50% off all A plus and Net plus Total Tester and Total Tester Sims bundles. The Sims are the uh, performance-based questions. So not only are we already cheap, but now Bomb Squad, we got them 50% off just for you, amigo, because I love you so much. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm scrolling back up because I think I missed stuff. Looking for questions. I think it's about time to start uh, power power show anyway. It's D Gausset. <laughs> Told you're a funny person. Ian Camacho, what's the passport promo code? Carpe diem. Seize the day. Captain my captain. Jose Braden, what should the name of what should be the name for the Discord channel? I don't know, just don't call it sucking chest wound. Uh, Mike's House of Pain. I don't <laughs> come up with something more neutral than that. The real Mike Myers. How's that? Yeah, I don't know if I want to do that either. Dreamer 77 DD, no, not offensive. Dreamer 77 DD, did I say something offensive? Scott Jurgen usually yells at me the moment I uh, do something like that. 2.59 p.m., Scott. Uh, oh, does anyone find my capitalism offensive? Okay, I remember now. Thank you. Uh, I get so paranoid. I mean, it's... Whatever happened to sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You know, I'm, you know, people make fat jokes and bald jokes all day long. I'm like, <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah. I literally avoid people under the age of 30 because I'm terrified I'm going to offend them. Scott Jernigan's about to text me and say, get on to another topic. Allie, will the Astros win the World Series? Of course they will. That was so embarrassing. Oh, God, Scott Jernigan's been typing for 15 seconds. I'm in trouble. Oh, he was typing, and then he stopped, which means he was about to preach to me, and then he backspaced it out because he's like, okay, Mike. I'm teasing you, Scott. It's because I love you, man. You and me. Okay, Alice, I'm getting to PowerShell. We're almost there. It looks like we're... Uh, J.E. Davia, do you recommend taking the core one and the core two later on? Generally, yes. Yeah. Eric Crenshaw, how long do you think it'll be before all our tech jobs are obsolete and done by AI? Eric Crenshaw, I heard that same crap in 1983. I'm serious. I've been hearing that for almost 40 years, Eric Crenshaw. You know what happens? There's more jobs now than ever. The problem is, is a lot of us are like, oh, I want to sit at a desk and install CPUs into a computer for a living. Okay, those jobs are kind of disappearing, all right? I mean, unless you want to work in a tech shop, the depot, or something like that. Uh, you know, today's techs are, are little systems analysts. That's why we're going to be doing PowerShell today, kids, is because, or at least getting started on PowerShell, because you're a coder. You, you understand systems. There is no hardware and software anymore. There is no... Uh, hardware and software and security and networking, they're all one thing. They're all together. And, and techs who take the time to, to be able to look holistically at a system are the ones who are amazing. Look, if there's one thing that has always blown me away, uh, the, the tech that I learned more from than anybody else, her name was Sue Lennox, and she was Cajun. I mean, she was Cajun, friend. You get up from the truck shy, 
She was so far deep in Louisiana that her sofa was an alligator, okay? And she had this innate ability. She was a high school dropout, but she had this amazing ability to look at a system holistically. And I'd be the one, oh, here, it's going to config dot this, you know, that, all this stuff. And she'd be like, boy, why don't you make sure it's plugged in? <laughs> Ah, uh, Sue Lennox, man. I wish I, I would, if I could find her, I would buy her a beer, man. Great tech. Absolutely great tech. And she was a tech when there was literally no female techs in existence. And uh, she was great. Calm, easygoing person, you know. Gosh, I haven't thought about her in 10 years. So, no. There's always going to be plenty of jobs. The problem is, is we have too many techs who think old fashioned about what a tech means. And anybody who just looks at the CompTIA A plus or net plus uh, objectives can get a real idea of, of where the demands are. CompTIA didn't sit there and go, oh, let's put PowerShell in as an objective for fun. They were being yelled at by people. And uh, that, that's why it's all there. That was 302, Scott. 306. Okay, four more minutes. We're going to start PowerShell. Alice, don't leave. Ian Camacho. Sue's last name was Lennox. L-E-A-N-O-X. This is the early 90s. I don't think that Linux even existed at that point in the game. Elbow. If computers can function without us completely, they cannot. We've got more to be worried about than using our jobs. I, for one, worship our new robot overlords. Jose, I'm not, you're going to make, you're going to make the name of the channel. I'm not going to do this. Whatever you do is going to be fine. Just don't make it obscene. That's the only thing that I'd have a problem with. The Zerk 678, what does a cybersecurity analyst job look like? I don't know anyone who does that and it's kind of, and that is kind of the job I'm aiming for, for DOD job. Uh, Xerxes, probably the first thing you want to do is dig back. We did a video uh, with Jessica Dickerson, who uh, works, well, work, she's in a different job now, for a IT security company that hired in, uh, entry-level uh, techs. Everybody's like, well, there's no entry-level IT security jobs. There's quite a few. They're hard. The hours stink. It doesn't pay that well, but those jobs are out there. Uh, so you need to look it up. Uh, Scott Jernigan, any chance that you would remember what date that one is? You should be able to search the Total Seminars channel and look for uh, IT security entry level jobs. And you can find that and really get some idea of, uh, about that type of stuff. Um, Scott, that's 3.06 p.m. Kevin Lopez, I would definitely watch a Mike Myers docu-series on his life. Uh, no, you don't. Not ready for primetime Myers. That's me. I should find her. All right, we getting there? We got a little bit of a slowdown. I think people start stop asking questions for a minute because they're like, if we keep asking questions, Mike's not going to start on PowerShell. So, all right, let's let's we're going to dive in. I'm going to stop looking at around uh, Scott Jernigan. Uh, da, 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 da. Alex Potsy's raising her hand. Uh, Dave, Debbie Stouch. Of yes, of course Dave's going to be here on Friday. All right. Okay, guys, I'm going to quit talking. Let's do PowerShell. It's 3.09 p.m. Uh, if I missed any questions, it's going to be from 3.07. I feel funny. I always have to put the timestamps in, but that's okay. We'll do that. It helps Scott, and I want Scott to be happy because when Scott's happy, I'm happy. So let's do PowerShell. You guys ready for this? All right, so let's talk about a few things before we dive totally in about PowerShell. Number one, um, you guys are guinea pigs. Do you know that? And uh, I've 
trying some things presentation wise about how to teach PowerShell. There's some very strong opinions on how one teaches folks like yourself, who I assume are fairly good techs or motivated techs who have not really worked in scripting languages. So you're really, the two big worlds of computing have always been the uh, techs and the administrators versus the, the, the code heads, the programmers. And they're two separate universes that rarely, in my opinion, overlap or at least overlap well. And uh, so there's, there's very interesting philosophies about this. So we're gonna try Mike's idea, all right? So part of why I'm bringing this up is A, things can blow up. I've lost two virtual machines already prepping for this course. And then secondly, more importantly, I'd really like some feedback from you. Don't give me feedback in the chat. That's not gonna do any good for me because I, I don't read it really because it's scrolling by so fast. But I would be very interested uh, in general, uh, other than it's great. I always appreciate those, uh, and I, it's very nice to hear those. Those you can put in the chat. But if you have a critique, or if you, especially if you've got a constructive criticism where you think I could do something better or take a different direction, tell me about it. Or if you get a place like, well, Mike, I was doing fine until you got to here. Those are really good things for me, and you will literally, those watching today are going to help develop and change and form how I present PowerShell to people. So no pressure, it's all good, all right? So uh, what I wanna do today is, uh, for those of you who came in late, Alice, uh, what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be talking about PowerShell in a more, I'm really, we're not gonna write any scripting today, not one. We're gonna be treating PowerShell kinda like we're sitting at a command prompt, the old school cmd.exe. And I want to develop conceptually what that is. And then in another uh, course, we're going to come back to PowerShell. And by the way, that course is either going to be, it's probably going to be Wednesday, although I got this Active Directory thing burning in my brain now too. If it isn't next Wednesday, it'll be uh, probably Monday of next week. And we're going to talk about actually starting to build scripts. So we're going to take this too. This might even be three courses, mainly because I don't want to melt people's brains. And to be honest with you, my biggest concern today is I've got everything laid up and I'm just waiting for something to snap on me. So let's just go for it and see what happens, all right? So let's get started. And uh, da, 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 da. I'm not looking at any questions right now. All right, let's talk about PowerShell. You guys ready? Here we go. All right, all right PowerShell, yes. No money is spared making high quality PowerPoint presentations for you guys. Whoa, why does that look so bad on the big screen? Hang on, kids. Oh, that looks good. Okay, no, never mind. Okay, here we go. So, uh, all right, so number one, why PowerShell? Okay, so compared to the Unix Linux operating systems, Microsoft's old shells. Uh, the old command.com and later CM, cmd.exe, they were weak and they, they lacked features. All kinds of stuff. Uh, the built-in scripting language, which is the old batch files, was incredibly limited. Um, it couldn't talk to the system's critical databases. It, there was no way for batch files outside of using third-party tools to access the registry or to you know, query user accounts or anything. There, it was just never built into batch files. Batch files predates Windows. Uh, it couldn't talk to other programs' APIs. So if you had um, Office, it, Microsoft Exchange or something like that, you had no language to query it. Now granted, Microsoft tried stuff like Visual Basic and things like that. And I'm not going to say there's anything wrong with Visual Basic. It's, it's a powerful tool and still used more than you could possibly imagine. But uh, you, you end up seeing these less than 100, less than 50, let's say 20 to 25 different weird APIs where Microsoft's trying to get stuff to talk to each other, you know, and uh, from com and dcom, you know, .net much later, which is great stuff. I'm not saying any of these are bad. Some of these are old, uh, but it was a weird way to do stuff. And people who were used to Unix Linux environments where they could pretty much get any of the command line tools to talk and do, 
uh, text manipulations or uh, user controls or anything like that find themselves extremely frustrated because in order to do a lot of stuff, they would have to go to graphical user interface. Now, this is what gets me in a lot of trouble. Well, it doesn't get me in, it gets you in a lot of trouble. And that is, well, Mike, you're, sh you're gonna show me three or four things that I'm about to that you can do in PowerShell, but I can do that from, uh, uh, from the GUI. I can add a user in Windows. I don't need PowerShell to do that. I can go into disk management and partition a hard drive. Yeah, but you can't do 500 of them in one sitting, okay? PowerShell really comes into play when you have lots of repetitive tasks or you've got to query the same stupid log for the same stupid stuff every day. You don't want to go into event viewer. You want to be able to type in a little command and go, okay, that's what I'm seeing today. When you want to query 500 machines to see if something's happened between now and the last time you checked, that's where things like PowerShell's languages become not only good, but absolutely required. It's not a choice. So if any of you guys want to come back at me and go, oh, Mike, I can do that in Windows. Yeah, but you can't do it for 475 machines. Do you understand the difference? Okay. When you say PowerShell, you're usually saying enterprise. When I'm sitting here at the house and I have to create a user, I don't use PowerShell because I don't have to. I've only got 12 computers in my house, so I can do those on an individualized basis. But when we're in the office, I don't even do this. Michael Smyre in the office does all this. He relies on PowerShell to talk to Windows for doing big batch processing kind of things. All right. I'm not done getting off my soapbox, by the way, but let's continue on. All right. In fact, the, the, old, the old command shells couldn't talk to any APIs. There was just no connectivity there. It wouldn't even really work over a network, although you could call programs that could do stuff over a network. When you were at a command line, you, there wasn't a lot of networky stuff you could do. Maybe the net command, that was about it. And this goes on and on and on. I haven't even begun to touch the limitations of the old Windows shell compared to Unix Linux operating systems, There's apples and oranges. And Microsoft knew this. So this is where PowerShell comes into play. So the first version of PowerShell came in back in 2006, which wasn't that long ago. So we're going to see it in Windows Server 2003, Windows XP, uh, and it's gone through a number of versions. So the most common version you're going to be seeing today is version 5.1. Any of you who know PowerShell are going to go, Mike, I thought it was 7.1. It is, but just hang on for a minute. So PowerShell version 5.1. Okay. So the goal of PowerShell was to give Windows a shell that compared to the Unix and Linux shells, but with a Windows twist. So that's the big thing when we're talking about PowerShell. PowerShell is a great shell, but the tool set that was with the old command line just couldn't edit a registry, couldn't partition a hard drive, couldn't query all the computers on a network to see uh, which version of Windows update they have. They couldn't uh, verify the number of sites in an Active Directory domain. There, there was no language for that, and that's where commandlets are going to come into play. And that's really the main thing we're going to be doing today is playing with these things called commandlets. So number one, PowerShell, it's a shell. Number one, it supports all the old command, the CMD commands like CD, DIR, copy, they'll still work. Oh, there's some caveats there too. And it supports thousands of these new powerful commands called commandlets. See, C-M-D-L-E-T-S, that's commandlets. But it's also a scripting language. So it has, it's, it's completely object-oriented language. Uh, it, the files by default have a file extension called .ps1, that's on the A+. Uh, it has a complete integrated scripting environment, a development, it's a program to help you write code called the ISE, and integrates with everything Windows. I mean, it does it all. But it's also a shell. Now, I know I said it's a shell, but it's more than a shell. It supports JavaScript. It supports Visual Basic as well by default, as well as lots of other programs. So this is the thing people forget about PowerShell, is that, yeah, PowerShell, if I want to query a gazillion computers registries all at once, uh, yes, it will do that. But 
you can run JavaScript. You can run Visual Basic. With the right kind of add-ons, there's about 30 other programs that'll support it. Did I mention it's all free? Well, you gotta buy Windows. Actually, that's not true because we have something called PowerShell Core. PowerShell Core is a separate version of PowerShell. So you have PowerShell, the regular PowerShell that comes on Windows, we call that desktop. And then we have Core, all right? So Core is, it's a freeware. Uh, and you can, it's, it's a cross-platform version. It works on gazillions of operating systems, primarily on uh, Linux uh, type operating systems, works on Macs. Uh, it uh, doesn't have nearly as many commandlets. There's only about 2,500 commandlets versus 7,500. Now that would make sense. If I've got a new version of PowerShell that we're gonna call Core, and it runs on any operating system, we don't need all those commandlets to access the registry, do we? Because it's not, it's, it's not cross-platform, because only Windows has registries. Does that make sense? Does it also terrify you that there are 7,500 commandlets? And with each commandlet, it has all kinds of modifiers and strings. So there's a lot to it. The current version of, of PowerShell Core is version 7.1. Uh, it's available on GitHub. You can download a copy for, pick your operating system. Here's your link right there. Go grab yourself a copy of PowerShell and put it on Linux. In my opinion, and I'm sure there's people who would disagree with me, PowerShell has not had a lot of penetration in the non-Windows environment, mainly because those guys already have a lot of tool set that they're used to and like to use. Um, it does lean towards more cross-platform code to a degree, but usually when you're talking about PowerShell, you're talking about you are a Windows administrator, a Windows security person, a Windows IT, and you got a bunch of Windows computers all and Windows servers and all that kind of stuff. And that, that's where that really comes into play. Okay, so the, the other thing is that PowerShell doesn't erase the regular desktop PowerShell. If you download PowerShell Core, you're gonna have two different PowerShells that you can run. So you, you can run them both. So PowerShell is, inter yeah, blah, blah, I've already kind of said that stuff. Now PowerShell, it is interesting, but you're not gonna be quizzed on PowerShell desktop versus PowerShell Core for CompTIA certifications. So we're gonna be using good old desktop PowerShell, the one that comes with Windows uh, well, as we talk about PowerShell, and that will get you through the exams, but you might want to consider grabbing a copy of PowerShell Core as well later. All right. So let's talk about commandlets, the heart and soul of what makes all of this work. Tell you what, before we do that, though, let's make sure that we can get PowerShell started, all right? So uh, I've got a little VM here running Windows 10, nothing special. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click on here and you're gonna see it says Windows PowerShell Admin. And I know it's probably small, but I'm hoping you guys are following along on your bouncing computers. And I want you to start this Windows PowerShell in admin mode. I'm sure that there are good reasons to start PowerShell in a non-admin mode but I'll be darned if I can think of a good reason why. So if any of you guys have ever worked with the shell here, here they're even trying to get you to use core right there. Anyway, so I wanna make a couple of adjustments here because I just want this to be a little bit more visual. So I'm gonna increase the font size slightly just to make it easier for you guys to read. So hopefully that helps a little bit, okay? So I can tell I've started this in admin mode because I'm in the C colon backslash Windows System 32 folder. If I had started PowerShell in the non-admin mode, I would have uh, not, I wouldn't be in that folder. I'd be in the C colon backslash users backslash Mike folder or whoever I'm logged in as. So that's a pretty good clue whether you're in administrator mode or not. Those of you who've run the old command shell, you get the same thing happening. All right, hang on. 
I'm beeping and honking like crazy. Okay, no fires. Sorry, guys. All right. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, first of all, let's just look at the screen for a minute. All right. So you can type most of the commands we know and love from the old command line still work. Uh, CD space dot dot. See, that brings me up one. I can type dir. I mean, those things work. But you can also do some fairly interesting things. Like PowerShell supports a lot of Linux commands. So watch this. LS. Anybody know Linux? Hey, look at that. So you're like, oh, this is so cool because I can run Linux commands or I can run old style uh, command line commands. Well, there's some limitations. All right, so here I type CLS to clear the screen. Here I'll type DIR. So I'll type CLEAR for you Linux guys. That clears the screen. So it's like, oh, they all work great. Yeah, well, you're going to start running into problems. Like, for example, I'm going to write L. <coughs> I'm going to type LS minus R. Pretty common LS command. All right. So it, it's. It, it, it acts kind of sort of like the right way. So you're like, here, let me clear the screen again. So good, so let's type dir wide. Anybody do dir slash w? Oops, okay. So PowerShell supports the basic version of most of the old command line commands we know and love, but it is not a perfect one-to-one. -one. So there is still a place in our life for the old uh, command line, uh, pretty rare. I, I have not gone to a command line to actually do real work in a couple of years. Uh, you just have to learn to type things a little bit different. It's a new language. What are you going to do? All right. So, all right. So let's, let's go ahead and talk about uh, commandless a little bit more. All right. So uh, a commandlet is, is these thousands of new commands that are designed to communicate with just about every aspect of Windows. You want to talk to your registry, you're going to be using a commandlet. You want to take a look at your users, you're going to be using a commandlet. Pretty much anything you want to do, you're going to be using a commandlet. So if you can do it graphically in Windows, you can do something from a commandlet. I'll bet a nickel there's something you can't do, but I don't know what it is. So commandlets are objects. And they use a verb noun nomenclature. So they all start with a value, like I'm going to list a few of them out here, but they always start with something like get or new. So get means you want to get some information, you're querying. New means you're going to be doing something new, you know, new directory, new user, new something like that. Start means you're going to be starting something, starting a process, something like that, starting an executable. Uh, out means you're going to output something. It means query. Not only do you want to query something, but create some form of output. Stop means you want to stop something. Set means you want to set some kind of variable for something or another. And then probably the first one I want to start with is get help. So when you first start playing with commandlets, we tend to get a little overwhelmed because there's 7,500 of these. Okay, well, first of all, there's a pretty good chance that 6,500 of these you will never ever use in your entire career, okay? Um, but you, you start getting comfortable with the verb noun with a dash in between conceptualization, and it actually makes a whole lot less of them. The trick is, and this is always a problem with PowerShell, heck, it's a problem with any language, is how do you memorize all these? You don't. You never do. You may actually end up memorizing, let's, I'm not, you're not a programmer, okay? You're just a tech, you're doing support work. You may memorize 20 of these after a couple of years. But the thing with PowerShell is you're constantly checking references for what does this mean, what does that mean? I do not run PowerShell without a web browser open as I'm constantly researching. It's like, okay, so here's this command. Okay, what kind of switches does it accept? Does it take a pipe, whatever it might be? And that's normal, and that's okay, and that's good, all right? You're always going to have a browser up, and you're like, how the heck do I do that, you know? And don't worry about it. It's okay. Where am I? Oop, 
Okay, so let's go ahead and let's get into this guy. So the first, I want to teach you a command. Oh, wait a minute, I want to cover something else. The CompTIA A plus does not actually list any com uh, commandlets as things for you to know and memorize for the exam, okay? What I will tell you is that a conceptual understanding of what commandlets are, how you would research one and figure it out is about the only thing you're gonna need. Uh, we're gonna be getting into some scripting stuff which will come in uh, at, in another presentation. But if you guys are sitting here trying to write down all of these commandlets I'm giving you, you're making a mistake, okay? The ones I'm gonna show you today are pretty common and they're probably gonna be part of that 20 that you'll memorize but it's not gonna be on the exams. What's more important to me is that you understand some of the functionalities. And then one day in the future when it's like, how do I get help again? How do I get help again? You'll, you'll research it with some amount of knowledge. Does that make sense? Are we okay with that? All right, let's do it. <laughs> All right, so here we are Windows. And the first command I wanna teach you guys is, ready, get, uh, I'm full of typos. Okay, so what we're looking at right now is that uh, it wants to update itself because I haven't run it for, I don't know, 20 minutes. I'm also actually not on the internet here, so this is going to be a failure. I'm going to hit Y for yes to go ahead and update itself. I think it's going to give me an error because I'm, I'm not on the internet, so that should stop. Oh, I guess I am on the internet. There it goes, so it's updating itself. I'm going to take a minute and see if anybody is in a panic with questions okay so it looks like we're okay so I'm gonna go ahead and let that update for a second Dun. I am so glad so while that's update I need to warn you guys I've got a lot of commands I need to type in, and I'm gonna tell you right now that some of these commands can get kind of long, so you need to be patient and just lay back and enjoy the ASMR sounds of my mechanical keyboard. Oh, looks like it's done. All right. All right, so here we go. So I've got that, so let's try it one more time. Clear the screen. So get help, all right? So get help gives us the beginning of how we get help. Now you're, you're, the chances of you guys ever typing get help by itself is pretty small because it's just like typing help uh, at a uh, command line in regular CMD. It just kind of says this is how you get help and it kind of helps you get help and how help works. So uh, we're not gonna type get help very often. But what's gonna happen is we usually end up typing, so get help. And then whatever command that we're interested in getting help in. So in this time, I'm gonna use one called get process, which allows us to uh, look at the processes that are running on a particular machine. So we're gonna type get help, get process. All right, so what's happening now is that now we actually get some examples that make a little bit more sense. So here's get process, and it shows you some of the parameters and strings that we can put in here. The one thing I'm gonna tell you is just like help screens in the old command.exe, or even in Linux, where, you know, when you try to type in man pages, I often find the help to be less helpful than just going on Google and you know, type in you know, get process examples or handy ways to use get process. But you should know about the help because I'm pretty sure you're gonna see that on the exams if nothing else. So let's keep diving in here. Uh, I lost my place. Uh, hang on kids, I'm almost there. Uh, mm -hmm. So one of the things that we run into is a command like get process has lots and lots of subsettings on it. So, oh, by the way, up arrow key helps you, uh, you can uh, do lots of fun stuff like this. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna type in get process. And now what I wanna know is 
like we saw earlier, the Git process has all these values to put after it, but I really want to get some idea of how that works. So what we're going to talk about is something called the Git member. So this gives us a feel of what type of information the commandlet will return. So here's something we use. You see this little, that's a pipe. It's on every keyboard on earth, kids. You just got to find it. So, and we're going to type in git member. So what this is giving us here, guys, is what is kind of the information that we can expect from git process. So we can say things like a process is exited. So you see that? These are events, okay? Then we have all these different methods. These are actions we can provide to it. So we can close it. Uh, I don't know what all these mean. Uh, we can refresh it. We can start it. So these are all these settings. No, I don't know what all these settings mean. All I know is, let's go with an example, is like, look, I need to do some stuff with processes. I've got 47 computers that are all running the same stupid process, and it pops up every time the development guys are reinstalling another container of their stupid program, and I, as the admin, I have to go to all these machines and knock it down. Now, in this case, I'm just doing it on one machine. When we get into scripting, I'll show you how to do it on more. But at this point in the game, uh, I know what I need to do, not because I'm some PowerShell expert. I know it's a process. If I was in an old command line, I could type in kill process. So if I was in a old, if I was in a Linux box, I'd use a PX command, right? I don't know what the exact command is. Okay, really I do, but I don't know what the command is. So that's why I'm going to use tools like git method, git, sorry, git member to help me kind of figure out what I want to do. So all I did, I look at that, and here's a command that says, uh, where'd it go? Kill, or close, or start. So that's all I got to do with it. Does it make sense now? I always get terrified when people get into this. They're like, how does Mike Myers know all this stuff? Because, well, I practice these, because right? I want to give you a good course. But when I'm in the real world, I don't know this stuff. I'm constantly researching it, constantly. All right, let's dive back in. I'm still not off my soapbox. All right, so uh, let me go ahead and I'm going to start something up here. I want to start a process that's not going to knock the system down if I close it. All right, so I'm going to kind of leave this. Uh, how do I do this without confusing the bejesus out of you guys? There we go. Okay, so you can see Notepad over here running. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use tool. I could have started Notepad that way, but let's have some more fun. So I'm going to type git process. Now, I could, let's just type in git process Notepad. Poof, there it is. Okay, so because Notepad is up and running, it got me information. It's the the process ID, CPU usage, all that kind of stuff. But I, I see that it's up and running right now. So let's go ahead and stop it. Isn't that interesting? Once you start getting some idea of the nomenclature using the verb noun, suddenly all these uh, different commandlets are a little bit easier. Because if I typed in git process, doesn't it make sense that it would be stop uh, process? So let's type in stop process. Let's do notepad, and guess what? It blows up. That's okay. So uh, what's happening here is I haven't typed in the right nomenclature. So I'm going to go ahead, did a little research. I went and did the uh, help on it, and it said I needed to type in name. So all I've done here, guys, is I put in name, and hopefully, watch over here, kids. All right, type in your notepad. Boom, it's gone. That's a normal process with PowerShell, all right? In, uh, now obviously, this error I made was on purpose. It really was. Uh, but people freak out, and this is, this is a big deal. Anytime you're working on any command line, folks, and this isn't limited to PowerShell. Uh, this could be uh, in a Bash shell, on a Linux box, or anything. It is normal and good and okay to make errors, because 99.99% .99 of the time, typing in something wrong is nothing's going to happen. Yes, there are situations, but they are rare and weird 
where you could type something in and say, format the hard drive. Okay, I don't even think that's even possible, okay? But, you know, it, 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 it could potentially happen. So, you know, you take your time, you do your research, but you, know, you just you run the commands. You got an error, no big deal. Errors are good. I mean, if I took a minute to read this, cannot bind parameter input object, cannot convert the notepad value of type system string to something. So anyway, then it says stop, uh, it says stop process, and then it says notepad, and it's got a squiggle in Here, let me show it to you. Why am I just talking about this? So it literally says stop process notepad right there. You see that? This is a good error. It shows me where in the command that it got confused. So I'm looking at that and I would go, ah, it needed something in front of it because it needed more information. So I can stop process by uh, process ID, all kinds of different stuff. And I'd have to put in dash, I think it's process ID and then type in the process ID, whatever it might be. It's okay to make mistakes. We make lots of them. I, I do thousands of them. All right, Mike, we got it. Let's keep going. All right. So uh, I didn't, oh, I should have showed you this. Here. So I'm going to type in get. I'm going to type in get. <laughs> there we go. Get help stop process. Now watch this. This is the one help that will save your bacon. I typed in dash examples. So now when I do this, it actually gives examples of situations of how I need to do stuff. Look at that. There's the first example right there. Name notepad. Yeah, I guess where Mike came up with this uh, sample. That's right. I ran, the, I ran the get help stop process with the examples feature. You're going to be running get help whatever slash examples a lot. That is really, for me, when I'm running uh, PowerShell and I don't want to get on Google and find somebody else's mistakes, which happens, this is usually my first place I'm going to go to. Okay. All right, so what I would like to do now is uh, let's just look at some different kinds of commandlets that are commonly used. All right, and what I'm going to start off with here is uh, I want to do some uh, user stuff, but the problem is that I don't remember the user stuff. I remember it started like git local something. So I can use a, com a command that called git command, and what I'm going to, git command just helps me find the right commandlet. So I'm going to type in git local I don't remember the rest. Get loca. I don't know. And I'm going to put an asterisk. And guess what? It's, it's going to give me a list of all the commands that start with this. All right. So here we go. Get local group. Get local group member. Get local user. Get location. All right. So I want to find. I want to find the local users on this computer. So there it is. Yes. The downside to the get command tool is that you need to know at least the beginning of the command. Heaven forbid. Do not type get command space get star because there's a thousand git commands, but you get the idea. So I'm going to type in git local user. And I can type it just by itself. And it gives me a list of all the local users on this particular account. Administrator, default account, I got something called Freddy, I got something called Guest, I got something called Mike, and just the usual stuff. Only two of them are activated, Freddy and Mike. But it gives me a quick idea of all the local users on this computer. Now, PowerShell is really, really good at doing stuff on remote computers. And unfortunately, that's <laughs> I blew up all my virtual, other virtual machines. I had it, it was the most beautiful demo in the history of Mike Myers. And I had these other machines running on virtual machines and I was gonna show you how to, and it blew up, sorry. The bottom line is that uh, PowerShell does a great job. Anything that I can type, in a local machine, assuming I have the right permissions, I can type it for pretty much any machine on the network. Let's keep talking about local users. So what do we got here? So I want to take a look at that uh, Mike account. So I'm going to type 
get, there we go, right? Get local user, and in this particular case, what's his name, Mike? So I'm just type in Mike, hit enter, and okay, not a whole lot of information, but I do see that I do have a local user called Mike and not much information. So what we want to do here is we'd like to have a little more from information than that. So we use a pipe and a very handy pipe that you're going to see all the time called select all. And now I get a listing of everything I want to know about that particular account. Things, important stuff. There's the SID, uh, good information like that, that can be very, very handy to help me get an idea of what that particular account is. Well, that's fun, Mike. I know, I know. You can do that from the GUI, right? You can't do it for a, I need, I, I, I can eat, when I have other computers, I can say, show me all the local user accounts called Mike on the entire network. Pretty handy. All right, so let's go ahead and do it, and this time, let's add a user. All right, let's clear the screen, because I, I like clearing the screen. It's just what I like to do, matter of personal choice. So I'm going to type in new. Hey, look at this. Anybody want to guess how you make a new local user? That's right, local user. Now, I can just hit enter here, and it goes into a uh, interactive mode. Uh, so I type, make a user called Blanche. I got to type in a password. And I've now created a user called Blanche. Any of you guys who have tried to make a new user account, a new local user account on a Windows system lately, you have to type in all this goo, you have to type in the three uh, questions, it's trying to make you use a Microsoft account. It's a pain, right? And this is one situation where I very, very happily use uh, the PowerShell, mainly because it makes me avoid all the garbage that the Microsoft add a local user makes you go through. Yeah, I don't need three secret questions. Okay. So, you know, we, we don't, we can automate more of this. So for example, I'm gonna use, I can add a switch uh, name, for example. Still gonna ask for a password. And now we've made a Mike42 account. And there they are. There's Blanche, and there's Mike42. Now, as you might have mentioned, there's a lot more to making users. For example, I could make another, put another switch on there, add them to particular groups. Uh, I can put in passwords. Uh, I don't want to do passwords today because it requires variable usage, which is actually kind of cool. Uh, and I want to teach you guys variables when we do scripting next time. But I, I do much more with that new local user than just type in the name and still always have to type in a password. Uh, I can set this thing up to look at uh, <clears throat> human resources hired 200 new employees and they store everything in an XML document. I can easily, did we just blank out? Okay, okay, we're okay. I can easily uh, have PowerShell query an XML uh, spread uh, spreadsheet and go ahead and just grab all the different information. I can go ahead and query it and say, look at this, these are last name, first name, and put that in as the, concatenate it, put that in as the username. I can set them up in the right group based if they're in the accounting department, then query that, then make them a part of the accounting group. All that stuff. And it can be handled automatically. There is no Windows administrator I know out there who doesn't do this. Everybody does this. As a matter of fact, when we get into scripting, I'm going to show you that pretty much all this stuff is pre-made and we just steal other people's work. Let's keep going. So I was buffering there for a minute, guys. I'm hoping that uh, it looks like I'm no longer buffering, so I'm going to gamble we're okay. So let's do, I don't know, I'd like to see what, what uh, updates have been done on this system. So I can do, uh, but I don't know, where is it? So I can type in get hotfix. And it can quickly show me 
all of the uh, Windows updates that have been installed on this system. It's a pretty new system, as you can tell, so it doesn't have a lot. All right. Uh, the problem that we run into is we can get a lot of information on a more complicated system. So what we can do is we can run git hotfix and we can use that select again. Select is a very handy tool here and we can say select and you see up that we got five columns uh, at the previous command, source, description, hotfix ID, installed by and installed on. So I can say things like uh, select the hotfix ID and what else do I want? When, when it was installed. And you see where I'm getting that, guys? I'm just reading, reading above. Yeah. Capitalization doesn't really matter, but I just get in the habit. So now I can actually filter out, using that select command, what I want to see with that particular commandlet. So it does a pretty good job like that. All right, that was fun. Let's do it again. How about something with uh, event log? All right, so what I'm going to use is a command called git event log. So I need to warn you, one of the most powerful places where PowerShell is used all the time is querying all of your log files in Windows systems. It can access things remotely. It can do just about anything you want. Uh, the, the tool I'm using here is called git event log. has actually been deprecated with more powerful tools but the more powerful tools require more stuff. I'm worried that we're getting slowing down. I did get, a, I did get an error message for a minute, but it looks like we're okay. So I'm gonna gamble we're okay, kids. All right, let's just keep going. All right. So uh, even though this is a deprecated command, it still works. So let's, let's watch it do its do. So this is get event log. So what we're gonna do here is just type in list. Because we want to see what, whoop. so what logs do we have? Now, if you're familiar with event log at all, a lot of this should make sense. There's application, there's system, there's security, the big three logs that are on every Windows system. Uh, and there's also this thing for PowerShell, makes its own event log. So now that I know what the logs are, I can go ahead and take a look at the contents of one of these. So... So let's take a look, one that's not so big. Let's do application. It's only got 300 in there. So I can do log application. So if I do this, there's always a typo in there somewhere. So I'm looking at the error right now. Oh, I got a typo. <laughs> There we go, oops, okay, so, I mean, that's a problem. Did you see it just scrolled past, right? I was like, oh my gosh, I can't read all this stuff, all right? So we could use select, but select isn't going to, it's, we're still gonna see all the records. We could trim out some of the stuff we don't wanna see, but uh, what we wanna do is limit the number of things we're seeing and maybe format it so it's a little bit more visible. So again, this is just a matter of knowing how to play with this guy a little bit. And uh, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to type in, and this time I'm going to use the select command, and I'm just going to choose message. What is the log message? I am just having so much fun. How about if I type in the select command? S-E-L-E-C-T, there we go. All right, so what's happened here, we're only seeing the message, but messages are big, in log files, and you can see they're all ellipsed out because they're too big, okay? So now I gotta mess with this a little bit more, and this time what I'm gonna do is say, I just wanna see the first one. So, let's go with that. Now it shows me the first one, but that even that one still, do you see how it's ellipsed out? So I've gotta do even more formatting. It just doesn't end sometimes. Here we go, and we're gonna use the FT. This is the, the, it's used to uh, form the data. And this time I'm going to do a uh, word wrap. And now I can finally, I see just the first message and I can see the complete uh, error or event, whatever that is. 
a big challenge when you're working with stuff like event log from a command prompt because a lot of times it's sometimes it's hard to read. So a lot of times all PowerShell does, it, it comes out with a way for me to grab all my whatever I'm interested in and then I can redirect that to another file which I can then read in Microsoft Word or I could make an XML file out of it and pull up a web page and you know here's the status of the scary errors uh, and, and everything just works. So even though PowerShell may not be the best place to actually look at all this stuff, man, PowerShell is the place, it's really the only place where I can go through 400 different users' event logs looking for a particular error. Does they, who else is getting this error? Take the entire thing, pipe it over to a XML document or whatever you like to use, or heck, a text file for all I care, and then you look at it. Cool, huh? Let's keep going. Wow, okay, we, got, we only have time for one more. Goodness sakes, how did this happen? Let's just do one more, and then we'll, I, I had a few more demos, but uh, let's do one everyone likes. It's called, let's do get disk. Okay, we type in get disk. What we're actually looking at are all the disks on this particular system. And it's hard to read, so let's go ahead and pipe that, do an FT wrap, so it's a little bit easier to read. Oh, that doesn't help. That's okay, kids. We've got other ways to do this. There's another option called auto size. Whew, there we go. All right. So what I have here, I got two hard drives on this system. One of them's configured as a MBR. That's the system I'm actually running on. And I've installed another virtual hard drive, which you can see on the right, it says raw. It's completely unformatted. So God bless it. How did I run out of time? Kids, I'm going to stop here because I, I could either run over 10 minutes, which Scott Jernigan is going to kill me if I do that, or I can stop right here. So obviously we're going to pick back up on Wednesday, guys. So hopefully what we've learned at this point is that uh, PowerShell really brings in, primarily through the commandlets, all kinds of new powerful tools that allow us to query and understand and edit and change everything that's Windows. And we haven't even run a script yet, have we kids? Isn't that great? Uh, you get a lot of work done in PowerShell without running a script. Obviously, we're going to run scripts, mainly because A plus really asks a lot of questions about it. And uh, but I hope this motivates you guys. I really would like to see y'all play with your PowerShell and start get on get it onto Google and take a look at some sample. I don't know, maybe you get to find tutorials or something like that, and just play with the command list a little bit, just so you get some scope. Of, of what it can do. Uh, it is a wonderfully powered tool. When we get back, we're going to pick right back up here. I want to finish. We only have two more. I want to mess with this a little bit, then I want to mess with the registry. And uh, there, from there, we are going to go into the uh, ISE, the Integrated Scripting Environment, and I'm going to actually show you guys how to write scripts. Uh, and because that's a lot of fun. One, we're going to write a few very basic scripts, what we call hello world scripts. Uh, and then once those are written, then I'm going to show you what the real power is. And that is how to steal other people's stuff. So that, that is really the magic. Um, so I've got one minute. Are there, I mean, I'm hoping. Brendan S., I mean Monday. Sorry, today's Wednesday. Monday, Monday, Monday. So, uh, sorry about the blurriness, guys. I hope it looked like it fixed for pretty much everybody. Um, if, if there is an issue, uh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, everything's good on my end. Uh, but uh, we will pick up on Monday, literally right where we left off, and uh, we will continue to play with PowerShell. I hope, I hope you're a little excited. It's really a, an amazing and wonderful tool, and, and you'll never go back to CMD. Um, so I think with that, I apologize uh, that I have, if I've missed any questions, just come back on Monday and ask the questions, all right? It's never a problem. Don't forget, you can always send me an email. Here's my contact information if I missed anything. Um, so just uh, send me an email at michaelm at total7.com. Uh, also remember that just because you were nice enough to show up today, we got 50% off 
all of our A plus, Net plus, and Security plus practice questions. All you have to do is type in Carpe Diem, seize the day over at www.totalsim.com. So with that, it is four o'clock and I have got to go. So fine, fine, there we go. I think we got it right. Come on, little computer, you gotta be with me. There we go, all right. So guys, with that, I'm gonna say good night. So this is your little Uncle Mikey saying good night and I will see you on Monday. Good night.